Good afternoon, brethren. Happy Sabbath. Today, um, I had it on my mind to share just some thoughts on John Bunyan. Okay. If everyone's familiar with John Bunyan, John Bunyan is the one that authored the book Pilgrim's Progress. And he was born in 1628. John Bunyan, okay, when, when he was a, a young man, his father was a tinker. And a tinker deals with pots and pans. He used to go around selling pots and pans. And um, his relationship with his father wasn't always the best. And early when he was young, his mother died. And his father remarried. And in that remarriage, he became very rebellious. Do we have any rebellious children here? <coughs> Very rebellious. He wouldn't listen. He was always getting into trouble, always getting into fights. But one day, okay, one day, he became converted. What was Bunyan before his conversion? Who wrought in him the great change? His life reveals the power of the divine physician. He was dead in trespasses and sins, but Christ recreated him. It's all about Jesus. He took his mind under his control and showed him wonderful things, enabling him to place them in such a form as to be the means of enlightening many in regard to the Christian warfare. Twice, when he was a young man, he nearly drowned. And then during the time of the Civil War, he was under the service of Oliver Cromwell. And he was just about to go into a fight when uh, uh, another soldier says, let me please, I want to go. And in that fight, that man, he was killed, shot through the head. And it made John Bunyan think he was just minutes away from dying. Maybe, maybe there is a God in heaven. Maybe... Some divine hand spared him for a purpose. And he struggled back and forth whether to be a good man or not. Struggled. Do you ever struggle with your Christian experience? He, in his early part of his life, in, in this conversion experience, he was a legalist. He never had a true thorough conversion in his heart. And he married a, he married a lady... And this lady's father, he was a godly man. And he always thought, oh, if only I could be like him or be like her. And he thought, maybe by marrying this woman, it will help him in his conversion. But alas, it didn't. Then one day, he was walking around and he heard some women gossiping. Mostly women gossip. He heard some women gossiping. And as he kind of listen to what these women were saying, they were actually gossiping about their Christian experience. And they were sharing what God has been doing in their lives. They had a testimony. They were sharing that through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God was giving them power to overcome sins, to overcome bad character, to overcome swearing, to be better wives, to be better mothers. And he was shocked. And then he began to realize that maybe, just maybe, this God of the Bible is true. And that there is a power that can change lives. And through the reading of scripture, through this process, through this praying, and submitting his heart, and allowing Christ to take control of him, he became truly a thoroughly converted man. He trusted in God. He trusted in the word. Not in flesh and as a result of his preaching he would always get into trouble at that time um, he became very very devout he became a you know what was called a dissenter and shortly after his con his conversion his development Oliver Cromwell died and then the country went into a bit of kind of religious turmoil Charles II came back into power he was the son of Charles I came into power and he was um, adamant to bring in the Catholic faith or uh, a very strong um, church state. And as he preached, he ended up getting into trouble 
with the law. And here in Bedford was, this is where the jail was. But he was a man of principle. And the question is, what are we? Are we men and women of principle? Or are we men and women of policy? What do we base our lives upon? What do we base our thoughts upon? What do we base our decisions upon? Is it upon the word of God? Or is it upon so-and-so or so-and-so? He stood for principle. This is Bedford Church. And um, after his wife died, he had four children. One of his children, okay, young girl, was blind. Then he married, he married... And actually, before he married, he was caught in another uh, lady called Elizabeth. And he was basically saying to Elizabeth, it's better we don't get married. Because if we get married, I'm going to end up in prison sooner or later. And she insisted we should get married. Who's going to look after the young ones when you go to prison? Very practical woman. And, and literally, they get married, and, and, and pretty much, almost on the day they get married, okay, the, the sheriff's after him. <laughs> you are being accused of unlawful preaching. Have you ever been accused of unlawful preaching? Imagine that as a charge. Accused of unlawful preaching. By what authority do you preach? And that was pretty much his... His marriage life, 12 years of his married life. Why did the marriage lead to... Um... No, it didn't. It, 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 the marriage didn't, but he was saying that he knows that when he gets married, or sooner or later, he's going to get into prison because of his preaching, not because of his, his marriage. So he didn't want to get married, okay, and then have his wife without a husband. But the wife was saying, well, think about your children. And she encouraged him. She said... You've got to preach. In fact, if you stop preaching, I don't even want to marry you. That's why when his first to be married. He would end up preaching and then getting into trouble. And um, you know, he would end up in jail. And, and whilst in jail, okay, the jailer, every so often, would let him out okay, so he can go preach and then come back into jail. He said to him, Mr. Bunyan, if I let you out to go preach, will you promise to come back? And true to his word, he would come back. So he'd go preach in the forest, he would go preach in the woods. He'd preach. Nothing would stop him from preaching. This was, uh, his house no longer exists, but this is where his house was, in this location, in, um, in Ellsworth. Ellsworth, his, his, his house was. Um, Elstow, sorry, Elstow in, in Bedfordshire. And when he was taken into prison, he was taken into prison, okay, and the judge basically said to him, will you stop preaching? That's all the judge said. And the judge says, if you just say, yes, I'll stop preaching, you can go. And he said to the judge, he says, if you let me out tomorrow, I will carry on preaching. And whilst in jail, many, many forebodings came into his mind, like, what about my wife? What about my family? Who's going to look after them? Who's going to feed them? And every few weeks, the judge would say, will you stop preaching? And he would say, you let me out tomorrow, I'm going to continue preaching. That was his stand. Because he says, you know, he asked a question, who gives permission to preach? Is it God? Or is it man? Who gives us authority to do God's work? Is it church or state? Or is it the authority of God? So this is um, there's a museum. So he preached and he preached. And he would get into trouble. After a period of time in jail, what was only meant to be a three-month jail sentence, ended up for 12 years. He was 12 years in jail purely because he would uh, not recant. <laughs> and one day, he was, he was in his mind, he was, he was decided, you know what, I must, I must recant. 
What's the purpose? What's the existence of my life? While I'm rotting in this jail with the mice and the rats, and my children are starving and my wife's in trouble, I'll just stop preaching. So he tells his wife, I'm going to stop preaching. And what does the wife say to him? The wife tells him off. And the wife says to him, simple question. Is the law unjust Why you are here in prison? And he had to conclude that the law was unjust. And if the law is unjust, why am I going to capitulate to an unjust law? So the wife said to him, if you recant, then you're not the man I married. You know, wives, the wives that are here, you know, what are you doing to your husbands? Are you bringing them down? Or are you lifting them up? To be people of principle, men of principle. So he was in jail. And what happened when he was in jail? What happens when we end up in jail? Success does not depend so much upon age or circumstances in life as upon the real love that one has for others. Do we really love others? Because John Bunyan was saying, I love the souls of men and women. And I have to preach. I'm compelled to preach. And when he was in prison, he preached. Look at John Bunyan, enclosed by prison walls. His enemies think that they have placed him where his work for others must cease. But not so. He is not idle. Even in his circumstances, he's preaching. The love for souls continues to burn within him, and from his dark prison house there springs a light which shines to all parts of the civilized world. Imagine that. Someone in prison has an influence spanning the entire world. Wouldn't you like to be that kind of person? Where your life has an impact worldwide? His book, The Pilgrim's Progress, written under these trying circumstances, portrays the Christian life so accurately and presents the love of Christ in such an attractive light that how many? Hundreds and thousands have been converted through his instrumentality. Imagine that. He was thinking, what's the purpose of my life in prison? And as a result of him being in prison, he writes this book that brings light to hundreds and thousands. We may find ourselves in very trying circumstances today. And we wonder, what's God, what's God doing? And in those circumstances, God may be moulding us to do some super work that we have no idea. Have you ever been in prison? You know, it may not be a literal prison, but sometimes we find ourselves in circumstances which is like a prison. But at the end of the day, what did he do? Preached it. He preached it, and he preached it. Has anyone ever told you, right, be careful what you say? Be careful what you preach? Twice that happened to me. I was uh, at a church once. I was doing an evening vespers. And just before I'm about to go up, the elder pulls me aside, and he says, just remember, you're a guest here. Be careful what you say. He was warning me what I was about to say. And honestly, I got up on the pulpit and I was shaking. And I was thinking, do I listen to what he's told me? Or do I just preach it and not come back again? So I preached it and I still came back again. And then there was another occasion. Okay, I was doing some health lectures. And then the, the, the pastor, just before I'm about to do this health lecture pulls me aside and says, I don't want you preaching about veganism lifestyle. And saying that all seven events are vegans and stuff. And again, I was shaking. I was like, well, you don't even know what I'm going to talk about today. And afterwards she apologized. and said, so I, I was wrong what I did. But we know if God has given you something to preach about, you've got to preach about it. You've got to, you've got to talk it. And one day, you know, he's having this urge, no, I'm going to recant. And then the judge hears about it, so the judge calls him in and says, I understand you've got something to tell us today. And he says, 
If you release me tomorrow, I will continue to preach. Gospel workers, brethren in the faith, express no doubts. Follow closely your guide. You must dispense with him before you can lose your way. For the Lord has hedged you in on every side. In the darkest hour, Jesus will be our light. The path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. It is an exalted privilege to be connected with Jesus. Don't think it's a burden. Don't always complain that since I became a Christian, life is hard. No, it's a privilege to be connected with Jesus. It's a privilege to be connected with the light. In every condition of trial, we may have the consolation of his presence. We may be killed. We may be beaten. We may be suffering. We may be in prison. But one thing Christ assures us of, he is with us. We may live in the very atmosphere of heaven. What does that mean to live in the very atmosphere of heaven? Is that our experience today? What, what come, you know, come what may, do we have that peace, that surpasses understanding? We have the promise that we may live in the very atmosphere of heaven. Our enemies may thrust us into prison. But prison walls cannot cut off the communication between Christ and our souls. One who sees our every weakness, who is acquainted with every trial, is above all earthly powers. And angels can come to us in lonely cells, bringing light and peace from heaven. The prison will be as a palace. Imagine the prison being a palace. A little small room can be a palace with some shelves and a small bed. The prison will be as a palace for the rich in faith dwell there. And the gloomy walls will be lighted up with heavenly light as when Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises at midnight in the Philippine dungeon. Bunyan was confined in the Bedford jail and hence issued a light that has illuminated the pathway to the celestial city. It doesn't matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. God is with us. God is the rock of our salvation, a present help in every time of need. Then let us be no longer babes in Christ. When we murmur and when we complain, do you realize we demonstrate that we're just babes in Christ? But bold and firm soldiers of the cross, rejoicing in suffering and the will of God. That's what God has called us to be like. Soldiers of the cross. And in 12 years of prison life, he refused to yield. After 12 years in prison, he's released. And what does he do? He continues to preach and eventually gets back into jail again. Every so often, like I said, he'll come out of jail, he'll preach and then come back into jail. And everyone in that jail knew about Jesus. In the great controversy, it says this. Again, as in apostolic days, persecution turned out to the furtherance of the gospel. In a loathsome dungeon crowded with profligates and felons, John Bunyan breathed the very atmosphere of heaven. And there he wrote his wonderful allegory of the pilgrim's journey from the land of destruction to the celestial city. Are we, are we living in a nice land? No, we are living on this time's earth's history Yes, this is the land of destruction. This land is going to be destroyed. And we are on the pilgrim's journey to the celestial city. For over 200 years, that voice from Bedford Jail has spoken with thrilling power to the hearts of men. Bunyan's pilgrim's progress and grace abounding to the chief of sinners have guided many feet into the path of life. What did John Bunyan used to do in prison? pray. He used to pray. He used to study his Bible. He used to pray some more, study his Bible. And then what did he, what did he do? Preach. Pray, study, preach. 
and then he would write. And as he was praying, and he was thinking, what can I do in this Bedford jail? He decides, right, that I should start writing. I will write the gospel truths. I will write my sermons and get them out. And in that process, he's, he starts writing his Christian experience. And in that process, he begins, he, he, he begins to think that, you know, what is the Christian walk? And then his book starts to develop. And at the beginning of, of the Pilgrim's Progress, he actually writes an apology. He's apologizing for what he's about to write because it, what he intended is not what he actually ended up writing. And he apologizes for that. And so he begins to write, write, write. They say, don't they, that the pen is mightier than the sword. And as he wrote these gospel truths, things started to happen. And, you know, as the book starts, he says, I dreamed a dream. And as he's dreaming, he sees, what does he see? He sees a young man with a burden on his back. Why does he have a burden on his back? Why does he have a burden on his back? This man he sees in the dream. He sees his burden on the back, but he sees something else in the man's hand. He sees the Bible. And somehow what it is, the more this man reads the Bible, the greater the burden on his back becomes. And he's, and he's continually saying, you know, we need to get out of the land of destruction, but woe is me on this burden on my back. And the more he reads, he can't get rid of this burden. And then his wife and his family, they mock him. They persecute him. They say, you're a crazy man. You're a lunatic. Stop reading that book. Stop studying the Bible. But no, he has to continue. Because somehow he knows that though his burden grows, that this book contains life. And he's wondering, how can I get rid of this burden? His family's not helping him, so he flees. He runs. And then he meets a man. Evangelist. Evangelist, right, it, you know, gives him this thought, flee from the wrath to come. And then the evangelist, okay, says to him, because he asks the evangelist, how do I get rid of this burden? And he says, look over there, you're on the wicked gate, and walk towards that direction. Always looking at the light. Follow the light, and you will find the answer. Are we evangelists today? Each and every one of us, in whatever capacity, should be evangelists. We should be messengers helping people on the way. Showing them where the wicked gate is. And so he runs and he's going to follow uh, what evangelist says. And then another man, another man, okay, tries to persuade him, okay, not to go. There was a man called Obstinance. And another man called Pliable. And they say, don't go, this is foolishness. And then in the process of the conversation, Pliable says, I would like to come on the journey with you. So Pliable comes on the journey, and then they're having a discussion, and Pliable asks the question, why is it I don't have a burden on my back? Unless we really go into scripture, and I'll add going to spirit of prophecy, unless we go and say, Lord, show me my sins, you're not going to have a burden. You're going to think everything's fine. I'm all right. I'm a good lady seeing. It's only as we go to scripture and the word of God that we realize how bad we are. And that's why we get the burden. Question then today, are there any pliables here? Nehemiah is an example of the standard that must be maintained at any expense. And Nehemiah stood for principle. Neither danger nor difficulty would shake his adherence to the just, what is just? Holy, righteous principles of truth. 
The honour that must be maintained in the work to be done for this time requires staunch determination. Men are needed who will say, the hand of God is good upon me. Can you say that? Can you say the hand of God is good upon me? I will arise and build. Or do we wake up in the morning, I'm weak and tired and woe is me, what can I do? Work is impossible. There are today too many pliables. As in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, beware of the inclination to follow your own impulses. Adam, hiding himself from God, encompassed himself in obstructing darkness. Pliable means, right, that you go with the flow. You go when it suits. You don't stand on principle. You go because it might sound good. Look it up, what it means to be pliable. And as they travel on the journey, like all of us on our Christian journey, we sometimes lose sight of the light. And as, he's, as he comes to this slew of despond, they both fall in because he didn't keep his eye on the light. And when they fall in, pliable, you know, both of them are kind of drowning. And, and, and Pilgrim saying, help me, pliable. And pliable says, you're on your own, mate. <laughs> and so he gets out, he says, farewell, and runs off. And then he leaves Pilgrim to drown. Do you ever get into despondency? Mm. So, what does he do? What does he do? Okay. What does he do when he gets into this trouble? What does he shout? He shouts one word. Help. He's shouting to God, help. If you get so low, you can't get out of it, cry to God and say, help. So, help comes along, pulls him out. And he says to him, what are you doing in this little... He says, was you not looking at the light? Because if you're looking at the light, you'd have seen there was, there was nice good little stepping stones just under the surface of the water. You would have got it through fine. Pliable comes back to the city of destruction. And interestingly enough, you can't trust the ungodly because some of his friends said what a wise man he was for turning back on this dangerous journey. And other friends were saying how foolish he was because he had no backbone. After a little short distance, you can't even handle the pressure. And for the rest of his miserable life, Pliable was stuck between two accusations. A good accusation being wise and a bad one to have no backbone. Again, I asked the question, are there any pliables here? Let me read you this. Every youth needs to cultivate decision. If we cannot be able to make decisions based on sound spiritual judgment and on the word of God and on the spirit of prophecy, we are in danger. If we make decisions based upon our spouse, based upon our brother, based upon our sister, based upon our pastor, based upon the uh, 3ABN, we're in trouble. Every youth needs to cultivate decision. A divided state of the will is a snare and has been the cause of ruin to many. In Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, there was a character called Pliable. Youth shun this character. Do not be pliable. Do not do things because it's easy. Do not do things because you were told to do so. Do things because there's a principle. Those who are represented by it are very accommodating. Are you accommodating anyone? Don't you think it's good to be accommodating? It says those represented by pliable are very accommodating, but they are as a reed shaken by the wind. That means they're accommodating whichever direction. Accommodating to the devil as well as accommodating the godly people. They possess no willpower. Be firm, else you will find your house, your character, built upon a sandy foundation. 
Those who will keep in the path, cast up for the ransom of the Lord, must not be swayed in matters of conscience. They must show moral decision and must not be afraid of being thought singular. Are you afraid to be thought of singular, weird, strange? At your workplace, do people think you're strange, peculiar? When I go to Africa, they think I'm strange because I don't eat meat. Many there are who are changed by every current. They wait to hear what someone else thinks. Let me encourage us for this evening when we meet. Don't just be swayed because so-and-so says something or so-and-so says something. Oh yeah, so we go with that. Let's be sound, firm on the Bible and Scripture. If there's no principle, don't say, well, I'm going to follow because that's what he believes, that's what he says. Many, are, many there are who are changed by every current. They wait to hear what someone else thinks, what Paminda thinks, or what, or what Natasha thinks. No, let's have our own opinion based on prayer, based on the Holy Spirit. Why, why do we invite the Holy Spirit into our meetings in the first place if we're not going to listen to what he's going to say? They wait to hear what someone else thinks and his opinion is often accepted as altogether true. Many a time, me and I will have a kind of heated discussion and then we say, well, so-and-so says it. I say, well, so what? What, what, what does it say? They do not say to the Lord, Lord, I cannot make any decision until I know thy will. Let every one of us prepare for tonight and say, Lord, I will not make any decision until I know thy will. If these youth would lean wholly upon God, they would grow strong in his strength. We are not to fashion ourselves by the world's criterion or after the world's type. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Thus, as did Moses, you will endure as seeing him who is invisible. A cowardly and silent reserve before evil associates makes you one with them. Let me read that again. A cowardly, silent reserve before evil associates makes you one with them. When next time you're at work and they're gossiping about someone and they ask your opinion and you stay quiet, you're one with them. Tell them. You shouldn't be gossiping about this person. Tell them. And one thing I've learned is this. Anyone that gossips to you, right, as soon as opportunity arrives, they're going to gossip about you. Once a gossip, always a gossip. Have courage to do the right. Possess an individuality of your own. If you will succeed in anything that is elevating and ennobling, you must cultivate firmness for the right. Jesus has revealed to you your value by the price he has paid for your redemption. Your salvation has been purchased with agony and blood. You have everything in your favour. Everything has been done that God could do. In giving Jesus to be the propitiation of your sins, prop prop propitiation of your sins God gave you power to resist and to overcome evil. I want to encourage us adults here. Every action that you take, adults, every decision that you take, every move you make, every food you eat, every song you sing, is having an influence on every single child and youth in this church. And that's a responsibility. What I do, what I eat, has an effect on the little young ones here. Let that be a, a, a burden of responsibility. Because we've got blood on our hands, each and every single adult here, if we're not careful. Jesus has revealed to you your value by the price he has paid for your redemption. Your salvation has been purchased with agony and blood. You have everything in your favour. Everything has been done that God could do. What more can God do for you, Sergeant? 
What more can God do for you, Gabby? What more can he do? He gave his blood. He's pleading. He's giving you godly parents. In giving Jesus to the propitiation of your sins, God gave you power to resist and to overcome evil. You can be resolute if you will. It's a choice. It will require higher help than any human friend can give you. But that help is promised. If you yourself will consent to form new habits, this will require effort on your part. For if Satan sees you taking a step decidedly for Christ, he will employ every ingenious method to deceive and ruin you. But Christ has provided a refuge for the weak and tempted. His angels will help, shield and guide every trusting soul. Youth Instructor, January 25, 1910. You have within your reach more than finite possibilities. A man, as God applied the term, is a son of God. If you yield yourself to Christ, you become a son of God or a daughter of God. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear that we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. It is your privilege to turn away from that which is cheap and inferior, and rise to a high standard, to be respected by men and beloved by God. As Pilgrim rises up out of this, this slow despond, he walks his way then to the wicked gate, and there he meets the man at the wicked gate. And as he enters into the wicked gate, there's fiery darts coming at him. Every time any person wants to make a decided decision for Jesus, you're going to get fiery darts. Don't be surprised you, you all of a sudden things are going wrong. Some of us seem to think that when we believe in God, things are going to go right. And I always wonder if things aren't going wrong in your life, maybe you're just not following Christ. So the devil's leaving you alone. Then when he's in that, in that place, the Mr. Interpreter goes through some, some things and he shows him this little clip here where you've got, you got the devil, he's putting water on your fire. He's putting water to crush your zeal. He's putting water to crush your spirit. But behind the scenes that the devil cannot see, Christ is pouring oil. Oil, oil, oil. And it doesn't matter how hard the devil tries, he cannot extinguish your fire. He cannot. If your fire goes out, it's you that does it. Then he meets another man in a cage. This man was a professor. He had a PhD in theology. And in all of his learning, he'd done his head in. And he ends up being a lost man because his theology messes up his brain and he's in this cage wondering, how do I get out of this cage? And he's lost. And all, and all Pilgrim is saying is, just accept Jesus. No, you don't understand. You're not a theologian, you don't understand. And, and, he, and the interpreter says, leave him alone. Leave him alone. You can't help him. Ends up in the prison. And then he meets a man with a dream. And this man's dreaming. He's thinking he's a Christian. And, he's, and he thinks, oh, I'm waiting for the day of Christ. And then, lo and behold, he sees Christ coming. But something's wrong. Because when he sees Christ coming, he's seeing Christ coming when the new Jerusalem's coming down. And he realizes that he's going to be destroyed. Not being funny, it must have been something like six, seven years ago. It was in the Messenger. I, I read it was on the page one of the Messenger, okay. And I won't name who it was. It was done by a pastor, uh, a retired mission president, and he's writing, okay, um, about this dream he has and how he's, he's he's dreaming about how he sees Christ coming from the skies and the New Jerusalem coming down. And he's not realizing that 
That's exactly the same dream as this man is having. And it's at the, it's at the, the third return, when everyone's going to be destroyed. Because when the Holy Temple comes down, you're coming down with it. And if you're on earth at the time of the New Jerusalem coming down, you're lost. And that was on page one of the messenger. And then he meets a muckraker. Woe is me, woe is me, muck, 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 lots of mud. And it says here in Christ Object Lessons, but like the man with the muckrake in Bunyan's allegory, his eyes were fixed on the earth. He didn't see the crown that was above his head. Christ Object Lessons, page 253. We're looking too much in the mud, brethren. We need to rise up, keep our eyes heavenward. And then after leaving the interpreter, he's asking the Mr. Interpreter, how do I get rid of my burden? And then he realizes when he comes to the cross and he sees what Jesus did, his burden just falls off. If we've got burdens today, brethren, you know what it is? We're not going to the foot of the cross. Somehow along our journey, we've, we've lost the plot. We've got to go back to the cross and pray. I say, Lord, help. If that's all you can say, just say, help. On his journey, he meets a man, okay, Mr. Worldly Wise Man. And Mr. Worldly Wise Man, in fact, sorry, before he actually gets to the cross, I made a mistake. Before he gets to the cross, he meets a Mr. Worldly Wise Man. And Mr. Worldly Wise Man says, if you really want to get rid of your, your burden, you have to go up to the mountain, Mount Sinai. And there, you'll meet Mr. Morality and Mr. Legality. And so he climbs up the mountain and he realizes this mountain is going to crush him. And he cries help and the evangelist comes back and the evangelist says, what are you doing here? What did I tell you? Didn't I just say, stay on the path? I mean, are you hard of hearing? The law is going to kill you. The spirit will revive you. On his journey, <clears throat> he meets two characters jumping over the wall. And he says to them, he says to them, you can't do that. Who says? It's written in the book. Books, smocks, as they, as they said. And they, and, he asked, and they asked a question. He says, where are you? He says, I'm in the way. And he says, where are we? He says, in the way. So what's the problem? And he says, well, the problem is, is you didn't come through the wicked gate. Where's your certificate? Look, I'm in the way. You're in the way. What's the problem? I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, I'm an Adventist, you're an Adventist, don't judge, what's your problem? The problem is this, that if we see our brothers and sisters who are supposedly in the way, but they've come through some kind of backroot way, we need to help them. We have to help them get the certificate. And then, as he journeys, right, he journeys, he says, let's take a rest. Well, I mean, surely, didn't God make this resting place? So he rests, and you know what he does? He oversleeps. He slumbers. And in that rest, he loses his certificate. And then, and then an angel comes along, kicks him, and says, you, you, you know, wake up. And then he realizes it's getting dark. So he runs, and then as he's running, okay, he realizes, where's my certificate? So he has to go back, find his certificate, and he's thinking, all that time I've wasted, I could have been a lot further ahead in my Christian experience had I not slumbered. And then he arrives at the resting place at night time. And as he approaches, he has these lions roaring. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a lion roar? I don't mean like at London Zoo. I'm talking about the real thing. Emma and I, some years back, we were in Botswana, went to, went to a proper safari park, and this lion, right, charged us. I mean, there was a, there was a, a 
which were uh, fence, the lion charged us, right, and roared, and I'm not joking, the ground shook. The ground was shaking. It was like an earthquake. I've never ever seen that before. A lion roar like that and running. It was like pounding. So you've got these two lions and blocking his path now to get into the house. And now he's wondering, if only I had done this in the daytime, it would be easier. And now he's scared. Now he's stuck in the dark. So then, he's, he's thinking, what do I do? Then the man on the other side, he says, who goes there? He says, I'm a pilgrim bound for the celestial city. And he says, well, what are you waiting for? Then come. He goes, no, these, these, these lions. So the simple question was, do you have faith? So he says to him, just walk right in the middle of the path, because those lions don't have any teeth. Neither do they have any claws. And so he kind of like, you know, by faith, he's just walking in the middle and he can hear, those, you know, you know the, the, the wind vibrations of the paws trying to get him. And he walks through. And, he's, and he was so thankful to God that even in his, in his slothfulness, that God still got him through the lions. And then he comes to the rest house, and there he, he abides for a little while, and there he has some profitable discussion. You know, it's interesting, when we meet together as brethren, lunchtime, or at houses, or at social gatherings, do we actually have profitable discussion? What do we discuss about? Are we discussing biblical things, spiritual things? What do we actually, what do we actually talk about? Once, me and Paminda, this is some years back, me and Paminda, we decided that unless we've got anything profitable to talk about, we won't talk. And we didn't speak for two weeks. We didn't speak for two weeks. Because, because we realized that all the talk that we did wasn't even profitable. And it's only when you make a covenant you realize that all of our conversation is not profitable. And there they gave him his armor. And doesn't the Bible say, take on the whole armor of God? And then he climbs. He climbs up this hill. You know what this hill is called? It's called the hill difficulty. He climbs up the hill difficulty. And he slips a couple of times, okay? Because he's running, he's, he's really keen. And then when he gets to the top of the hill difficulty, do we ever have any difficulties, by the way? The last couple of weeks has been a bit difficult for me, but you know, we have some difficulties. And then he comes down the hill, right? And then he comes down to a, a, a hill, and he's coming down into the valley of humility. And as he comes down to the valley of humility, he's running, and he stumbles a good few times. In other words, he's failed in being humble. And because of, and because of that, the devil comes for him. The devil comes for him. And he says, you are my subject. And in that battle, he nearly loses. But in that struggle, he says, no, I am a child of the king. On his journey, he meets another character, Mr. Talkative. Mr. Talkative just talks the talk. That's all he does. And when he talks, he can talk about any subject. Yes, let's talk about the sanctuary. Let's talk about the state of death. Let's talk about the Sabbath. And the next minute, let's talk about the devil. Let's talk about gambling. Let's talk about, you know, breaking the Sabbath. He was a pliable if any there was one. Mr. Talkative will talk religion, but will not practice religion. Then on his journey, he comes with a companion. His companion was named Faithful. And in that journey then, they encourage each other, but they end up coming to this place called Vanity Fair. And Vanity Fair was right in the middle of that path. 
And we wonder that when we're on the Christian path, we don't think we're going to get tempted, we don't think we're going to have trials. But they build the city, the devil builds the city right on the path of the Christian journey. And some of us may hunger and, and enjoy the things of this world. I can tell you now, the world is just vanity. Five-star hotels are vanity. Rich food is vanity. Economy, business class flights is vanity. And in that process, in the discussion, okay, they get taken to court. And they're tried. You know what they're tried for? Their Christian faith, for being Christians. For saying that their land is full of evil. They're saying, you say you follow God, but we follow God as well. And by the very fact that way you speak, you're saying we don't follow God, you're saying we're a liar. And so, as a result, the jury full of some, one of them was called Mr. Hate. They convict them and they end up killing faithful. The more faithful you are, don't be surprised the more persecution you get. And he died a martyr's death. But listen, in that martyr's death, another character springs up called Hopeful. And through that death, he sees the testimony and he says, I want to make a stand for this truth. And then he carries on the journey with Pilgrim. Okay, this picture is not clear, okay, but what you have in this picture is um, they see a picture uh, uh, on their journey. They see the, the pillar of salt, uh, the pillar of uh, uh, Lot's wife. And it, says, and, it, and it says, remember Lot's wife. Remember what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. How Lot and his wife kept things of the earth as, as, their, main, as their main thought. Then they passed this cave. And in this cave, okay, there's like some, like a dragon breathing fire. And then they pass another cave and they meet Pope and Pagan. And in the story, Pope has no teeth. And he's weak. And he says, ah, oh, I've got my deadly wound, but the time's coming when my deadly wound will be healed, and then I'm going to get you. Then they come to, you know, some nice lands, delectable lands. Surely this is lovely, isn't it, being on God's path? And they rest and they drink and they partake of the fruit and they have profitable talk. Until one day on their journey, they come across a sty. And it's called Bypath Meadow. Have we ever been to Bypath Meadow? Ever been on the track and then we get bypassed away? detoured and he says look it's parallel in the journey it's parallel we do, look I can see the path and then they meet another brother right and they say yo brother is this the path to the celestial city he says yes and they say see he must be right and then as they go on the journey he falls into a ditch and dies and then there's a storm and then they realize that as they got off the path, they're in trouble. And then they come across giant despair. Ellen White says, if you're in despair, go back to where you last saw the light. Where did you last see the light? Retrace your steps. And then giant despair gets them, throws them in prison, and they're stuck. And what giant despair does, he actually says, I want you to commit suicide. Commit suicide, because if you commit suicide and take your own life voluntarily, you're not going to heaven. So he tortures them to make them, and then he gives them a rope and a knife, or poison. Hang yourself, kill yourself, or poison yourself. Either way, I don't care, die. And then in their lowest moment, okay, they start singing. And in that singing, he realizes, uh, Pilgrim realizes, he has the key of faith, the key of promise. And that key opens the prison door. And then they escape, and giant despair tries to get them, and then he loses, and they run. And again, all that time they wasted in despair, when they could have been journeying to the celestial city. And on their journey, they meet characters, and these characters tell them, turn back. Turn back, the way is too hard. There is no celestial city. 
He's praying. He's praying because people are discouraging him, saying there's no celestial city. Then he meets, some, he meets some godly people, and then they give him a map. They say, this is the map for the final journey. But he says, beware, you'll meet someone called the flatterer. And as long as you stay on the path, you're fine. <clears throat> so they meet this man, clothed in white, and they think he's an angel. And they ask him, is this the way to the celestial city? No, it's actually this way. So they follow the flatterer, and they end up caught in the net. And what do they do? What can they do? Help. So along comes evangelist, cuts the knife and says, what are you doing here? Did, did you not read the map? Are you blind? The map says this. Did, would you not wear the flatterer? Yes, but he, he would look like the angel of light. Exactly. And then they get whipped for their sins. Then they come to the delectable mountains and here they, they, they can you know, take some time and re replenish. But they have to be very careful because as they come past the delectable uh, mountains, they come to a place where the, the, the flowers will make you sleep. And they'll make you sleep permanently. Just before you come to the kingdom, there's these poisonous plants that if you're not careful, will put you to sleep. So what do they do? They talk. They're talking about spiritual things to keep themselves alive, to keep themselves awake. And then they can see the kingdom. They can see it. We can see the celestial city. Can we see the celestial city? How close are we? Then they meet another character called ignorance. They say to ignorance, right, where's your certificate? He says, I don't need a certificate. Well, how do you know you're a Christian? Because the Bible tells me so. My brain tells me so. It's all about what he thinks. It's all about his opinion. It's all about what he believes. Not based on scripture, not based on Holy Spirit. So they reason with him to the extent where ignorance says, you do your way and I go my way. Then they come to the river. Ignorance, he goes, he meets some boatman, he goes on the boat to the other side, and then he knocks on the door, he says, he says, I've come to the celestial city. And they ask him, where's your certificate? What certificate? And then he's one of these things, these people are rude. And, ba and basically Jesus turns around and says, I don't know this man. He's not one of my subjects. And then they have to throw him into utter darkness. And then Christian are hopeful, they're crossing the river and they're helping each other. Because at that crossing point, all of their sins are hitting them. In one way, this describes our time of trouble, Jacob's time of trouble. When we're going to have to be faced with every single sin that we've committed. And we're wondering, has God really forgiven us for all of those sins? And that struggle, and that conflict. And besides that point, there's two things certain in life. One is birth and one is death, unless you translate it. But at that point in death, are we ready to cross over? Is everything in our lives settled with God? Are we at peace? Have we asked God to forgive every single sin? And as we cross over to the other side, we come to the celestial city, the glory where we can rest, when we can flee from the, from the city of destruction, where it won't affect us anymore. Brethren, we've got we to be like John Bunyan. If the servants of God will walk with him in faith, he will give power to their message. If we don't have power to our message, it's because we're not walking with God. We're not walking in faith. They will be enabled so to present his love and the danger of rejecting the grace of God that men will be constrained to accept the gospel. Christ will perform wonderful miracles if men will but do their God-given part. If we're not seeing miracles here in this part of Wales, is it because we're not doing our God-given part? In human hearts today, 
as great a transformation may be wrought as has ever been wrought in the generations past. That tells me that we keep saying today is different to 200 years ago. No, it says here very clearly, in human hearts today is greater transformation may be wrought as has ever been wrought in generations past. TV or no TV? John Bunyan was redeemed from profanity and reveling. John Newton from slave dealing to proclaim an uplifted saviour. A Bunyan and a Newton may be redeemed from among men today. Who knows who's out there? Through human agents who cooperate with the divine, many a poor outcast will be reclaimed and in his turn will seek to restore the image of God in man. There are those who have had very meagre opportunities, who have walked in ways of error because they knew no better way to whom beams of light will come. Unless we go searching for them, they're not going to come. Richard, I hope you don't mind me saying, when I first met Richard, he was drunk. He came to a meeting and he was drunk. And I didn't realise, but, but just a couple of days before, when we, we, were, we were doing some outreach in town, and he picked up a card and responded. And then I asked a friend, I asked a brother, so can you go see this Richard? He's requested Bible studies. When he went to the house, the, the brother said, we're, uh, we're looking for Richard Kenny. And there was people saying, Richard Kenny doesn't live here. His friends was, were, was, were saying, they were thinking that this guy was someone from the police. So they said, Richard Kenny doesn't live here. But the brother persisted. He said he filled in his Bible card. He does live here. And eventually, Richard came. He came, disrupt. You think Richard disruptive now? He was disruptive then. He disrupted my meeting, shouting out. Duh, 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 duh. I gave him a set of Doug Bachelor videos. He, 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 he gets drunk in the morning, and then he watches this Doug Bachelor video, and within like 10 minutes, he sobers up. And he's never touched a drop of alcohol ever since from one hour of Doug Bachelor. Isn't this what he's talking about here? Where people are just looking for a little grain of light. And when they get it, they grasp it. And they go all over preaching about Christ. You can't keep Richard quiet. He used to go into department stores sticking Bible tracts in the, in the suits. There was a brother, right? He buys this suit. And he comes to church. And he says, he's looking in his pocket. And he finds one of my tracts. And he says, Banjo, wait, wait. He says, where did you do that? I said, I said, I've got nothing to do with it, I don't know. And then I find out that Rich is going to all the department stores until he's kicked out, that he's putting tracks into the suit pockets. So that un some, some unsuspecting person then buys his suit and he's buying more than just a suit. He's buying an opportunity to receive light. Brethren, one of the things about John Bunyan, he fellowship. He fellowship. He came together. He preached to talk about profitable things, to do profitable things. And sadly, the day came. He died. You know. You know how he died. He was going to reconcile a father and a son. There was a dispute between the father and the son. Heated dispute. The father disowns the son. And then John Bunyan rides there in the rain to say, no, listen, your father and son, you should come together. And then he rides again in the rain, does a preaching appointment, preaches a sermon. And then as he's riding in the rain, he collapses in the fever. And within 10 days, he dies. Death comes to us all. Let what days we have on this earth be profitable days. Profitable time. Time used in saving others, helping others. Walking with God, sharing with Him. I want to encourage us, brethren, today, that let's be like John Bunyan. Let's be men and women, youth, teenagers, children, of principle. Challenge everything. Challenge our parents. Challenge our uncles. Challenge our elders. Tell them, where does it say in scripture or where does it say in spirit of prophecy that we should do this? If it is your desire today to be like John Bunyan, to be like Jesus, to make our way to the celestial city, then I invite us to sing this closing hymn. He 
who would valiant be? I remember once Paminda preached a sermon and he, and, he, and he said, only stand up if you mean it. And generally there were some people who didn't stand up. If you don't mean it, don't stand up. He who would valiant be against all disaster, let him in constancy follow the master. There's no discouragement shall make him once we land his first. Vowed intent to be a pilgrim Whoso beset him round With dismal stories Do but themselves confound His strength the more is No foe shall stay his mind Though he with giants fight, he will make good his right to be a pilgrim. Since Lord thou dost defend us with thy spirit, we know we at the end shall life then fancies flee away, I'll fear not what men say, I'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that we will be Christians. Father, I pray that each and every one of us here will not be lost. I pray, Lord, that as we journey through this Christian walk, that, Lord, you give us all power from heaven. Help us, Lord, to be men and women and youth of principle. Help us, Lord, not to be like pliable. Help us, Lord, to have a reason for our faith that we have in you. Help us, Lord, to trust in you in everything. Help us, Lord, to stay on the path. Help us, Lord, not to be diverted. Help us, Lord, to have discernment. Help us, Lord, to have a heart after thine own heart. And most of all, Lord, I pray that we will be converted. Lord, I pray in all that we do, all that we are, that, Father, you bless us. Keep us and protect us is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.